that drive to be more than oneself, as one inevitably becomes through merging one's identity with an ideology comprised of that of a many others, is the only thing that is able to trump the individual's need of ownership over one's identity and own sense of moral principles. And so, it doesn't really matter if it is Jesus or Mohammed, if it's religion or atheism, or if it is the New York Giants versus the Philadelphia Eagles. What matters to the person is that the side one chooses is the one that is able to yield the person the strongest sense of belongingness. That through a brotherhood or a community makes the person's own perception of himself transcend his subjective reality for one that isn't as prone to doubt and moral ignorance as his individual sense of right or wrong. It is instead one that is able to support and reassure him that what he believes in is of a reality that through being held together by the minds of a great many others, becomes much broader through a shared consensus, thus more secure. A case could be made that like one would physically want to stick with one's tribe so as to increase the chances of one's survival, so would one feel inclined to do psychologically. Religion would then be the manifestation of this, that which directs the tribe toward a moral system most beneficial to its psychological health thereby reducing the chances of internal disharmony, and in fighting, thereby increasing its overall chances of survival. In turn, the tribe would pay gratitude to the deities that emerge as symbolic representations of the subconscious archetypes that arises from the spiritual cultivation that forms out of social bonding, which the tribe unknowingly bestows the honors of being the primordial forces themselves, as something divine, existing separate from themselves, and that they believe are the ones granting them these euphoric religious states, when it is in truth, the ceremonial connectedness of the tribe permitting the individual to feel as though one is part of something bigger, which which the person transfers onto the idols, causing that sense of belonging to instead be more in relation to a greater divinity than the group itself. This sense of divinity, or shared religious euphoria, that a people brought together through a unitary pattern of motion, rhythm or belief feel, whether it be in a ceremonial process, or at a concert, is when the logos, or the creative cosmic order that gave rise to evolution, thereby us as separate individuals, or vessels, each carrying the instinctive essence of that logos, reunites with itself. I would argue that this felt presence of God can only be truly felt if one indeed allows oneself to dissolve one's ego through behaving in synchronized patterns, often ones that point to an agapic form of love and fellowship, whether it be through meaningful social interactions, art, concerts, ceremonies, or through personal introspection, wherein one is able to diminish the intensity of the sense of I that separates oneself from others by engaging in mental patterns that enhances one's sense of place in the world and intimacy with reality. The feeling that one is in fact not what everything evolves around and one's responsibility to the fact of this. You want people to look at you the way you look up to others. You want others to see the world as you do. This is the logos trying to see itself through others by lessening one's differences. Awe and erection is the subconscious trying to imitate something bigger than itself. Your personality shrinks but you want to follow through on what you see and take in as much of it as you can. It's like you're being called on and realizing the immense challenges of this. You seek to imitate that which is bigger than you as a means to expand and survive. You can do this by joining a tribe, or by connecting with and participating in something, like a religion, where you get reverence from. One worships that which one's instinctive senses stirs awe in you, to become, be part of God, the infinite, the great mother. Asceticism is denying oneself of that which keeps one trapped in the individual flesh. The seven sins are all reflections of things that serves only the individual, and not the community. It is not a punishment of God to do these things excessively, but is a punishment onto oneself. Life needs to be hierarchical in terms of what you want to protect, so you have a family, a job, friends, etc. In order to distribute your libido into providing for these things which will in turn give you relief. If you are alone you'll need a greater hierarchical viewpoint of life for your libido to structure itself around, since every chance of relief can only come from within you and by how you view things. Either the external world needs to be big or your internal one, as long as there is enough distractions or events for the libido to drive itself toward and express itself through. Astrology is a religion, or set of explanations that can tell you who you are, which by doing so makes you part of the greater cosmos, as your personality and whatever faults you might see in yourself are made justified seen as they are a product of something greater. It isn't so much scientific as it is psychologically beneficial for the libido to find ways to identify itself through. And so, the reason we resonate with figures like Jesus isn't because he sacrificed himself for our sins, because what does that really mean? 
Why does someone young and innocent dying in front of his mother in the most excruciating way for the sake of the sinful bring out in us such profound feelings? Again, it isn't so much the heroic sacrifice itself that stir us emotionally, it is rather the fact that such a story could resonate with us at all that makes it so powerful. Not the act, but our ability to perceive it as an act that is virtuous, that cements its importance. Objectively it is nothing more than a ceasing of life, but through our religious filter of perception it becomes so much more. Jesus' death is objectively nothing more than the end of his life, nothing more than an amalgamation of cells seizing their biological function, but through our ability to grasp symbolism, it becomes a sacrifice, a life surrendered to save and advance the world, in terms of raising the threshold with how we are able to derive meaning from it. His example lets us see the world through the sacrifice wherein all that love that was given in face of so much hate allows us to better direct the collective, the tribe, toward that which most strengthens that presence of God, of that cosmic logos, having set the bar for how high love should be prioritized among us, as love is what ultimately unites us and helps us survive, thus enabling the logos that is in each one of us to express its potential more fully, now with its physical needs met, protected by a community it trusts, and with the barriers of our different egos softened. Our ability to resonate with Jesus' story comes with the fact that we have been conditioned throughout our tribal way of living to be receptive to symbolism that enhance the importance of the group. The display of God's immeasurable act of love and forgiveness in the face of such evil make us feel as though we're part of something bigger. It is what reassures us that despite our worst transgressions, there is salvation. This instinctual need for a reliance on and protection of something that exists above us is essentially the tribe entity itself, the invisible, unspoken force that lets us coordinate our attacks and watch each other's back. It is this instinct, this feeling that expands beyond our mere sense of individuality, that has aided us to the top of the food chain. And so, it is easy to see why we have transferred the cause of the euphoria that comes with love and belongingness away from the individuality of the tribe to something that is beyond it, thus manifesting religion. We have always given depression and despair a face through symbols in order for us to tackle it, as threats are historically bound to come from things that are sentient, like predators. You can't deal with suffering from a scientific standpoint. You can't overcome the different interactions of neurons. You have to make it tangible enough for you to get a firm grip on it. Religion is what resolves various pain entities such as depression and despair. It is the psychological interface, the face you give the world in which you see it through and which lets you better tackle it. But if what I've said really is the case, if value systems truly emerge from a collective's desire to function most effectively as a singular unit, why then do religions refuse to set aside their differences when the very reason that they have a religion in the first place is one and the same? Why isn't it the foundation of what we believe in, the root of what drives us to a higher purpose that sits at the top of the value hierarchy, the energy itself, the logos that moves through us seeking to manifest its will? If this is what we mean by God, who the religious profess indeed to be at the top of their hierarchies, then couldn't it be agreed that his presence would be felt far more profoundly if people started acting like it was more than the condensed version we find in our writing? more than the arbitrariness of what you're allowed to eat or wear. That his full nature can't be abstracted through the confinement of norms and language. That there's a chance he supersedes our rational understanding. And that in turn, the most rational thing for us to do is to put the idea of there being a God above our own supposed understanding of such a thing. To say we understand God and to make rules on his behalf is in my view to put God beneath us. It is the belief that one can manifest every layer of reality and dimension of its eternal nature into a language which origin stems from the starved and angry cries of primates. God can't be found in what man believes he can filter out of the divine, but rather in man himself, in what has resulted from our logos millions of years of creation, in the unity of that result, the coming together of our once distant and dispersed species. Not in the dividing of it, in the abstractions of a language whose lifespan is to the cosmos not even the blink of an eye. The battle that Christians, Jews and Muslims fight is one over man's interpretation of the divine, not of the divine itself. In this fight of trying to protect their differences, with the differences being the ancient prophet's divergent interpretation of the divine, they fight not on behalf of any god, but on behalf of an ancient tradition. On behalf of those who profess they can understand the divine to the degree that they get to dictate its will. The contradictory nature of Jesus dying on the cross and calling out for God why God has left him, keeps us to our faith by us continuing to question its validity. 
When the question is in doubt it becomes eternal, as new interpretations depending on the time will make the religion grow. There needs to be miracles and enough doubt for one to destabilize the faith and break it down so that something new can emerge from it. The vision of Jesus on the cross seems to judge rather than come forth, seems to confuse rather than clarify. It's a terrifying vision because we don't know what to do with it. It seems to demand sacrifice rather than realizing that release steps into more life. We seek to understand everything. Yet the more we know the more we realize we don't know anything, and so everything we seek to understand become less. It shrinks. Old men in current communities will try to protect themselves from the next generation by using the symbolic positions they hold, and pretend to be the punishing father, the king and lord of tradition. The next generation grows up initiated in what the previous generation understood. But exclusive groups only create partial solutions to their problems because anything outside their group they leave out their sympathy for, and so any consideration is left out of their solution, meaning that their old way of thinking is never truly destroyed. If they aren't willing to compromise they will instead try and change the world to fit them. What they believe God saw as the highest good in men they try to accomplish only within the group, and so fail to accomplish it. How we do things are way less important than what we're trying to do. When something that gets done doesn't facilitates what it means to achieve, the problem will inevitably come back, like imposing laws on sex with abstinence or trying to quench homosexuality, which in the attempt at doing, will never eliminate it. One needs to integrate it, die to its powers and truth, so as to integrate it in the best possible way. I do believe there is an objective moral truth, but I hesitate to declare us capable of pinning it down to its finest details. But having done so, having made laws that justify stoning people to death, we only redirect the moral culpability at the divine so as to absolve ourselves of it. Whatever it is that may point to a moral truth, must be considered carefully and only acted on as though there was a possibility that it wasn't the truth at all, making whatever brutal judgments that were acted on behalf of the truth, judgments that may render the wronged or injured or worse, less attractive, and judgments more favorable to be all the more attractive. To live and express oneself as part of something greater is almost enough in itself, as it is the logos in its most fundamental sense, the fundamental part of what we are. And so, if one were to believe that man can't fully grasp the nature of divine, then why act on behalf of those who profess that they do? The prophets whose trust one places in, is based of that which most fits one's own narrative and not the narrative of the human race as a single entity of the sum total of the logos. If God's people is but a fraction of the human race and not the totality, then the fraction that believe they are is a people not of God but instead a people of their own version of him. The evolutionary logos that drive us want to be fulfilled as within every single person and so the logos demands to be realized to its most divine potential as indiscriminate of whatever religion or culture. It is its own entity, it belongs to no religion or culture, yet still we seek to claim ownership over it. This is like the masculine energy. Where in the religion structure that makes it possible for one to perceive the divine is what is praised. It is the idols, rituals, traditions that are praised, not the emotional resonance itself, the essence that the rituals reveal, and that we are all biochemically capable of feeling. This is just like the hero being praised for his courage to fight, not the amount of love he has for the thing he fights for. You act virtuous and lovingly through your religion. Yet you're not really doing it for any god, god being the necessary figure that enables us to come together under a higher goal. You're doing it for the sake that it makes your environment around you and the people better. We shouldn't believe in Jesus because we believe he resurrected, but because of what he said. It doesn't matter if he resurrected. What he said and how he died is not at all diminished if he didn't. We must put our beliefs in what is good. If what's written on the pages of the Bible is good, not if it's ultimately true. How good it is will decide how true it is. We want to imitate what's larger than us as we know that it is through being larger that we become more fulfilled, looking up at the night sky in awe, or hugging, etc. We do this without any intellectual reasoning preceding why we do it. To say there isn't a God based on physical evidence is to say God is physical. To say God is real is also to make an assumption. We try to think so much about what different things mean to us instead of acting on them. If you believe in the teachings of Jesus, do what he actually tells you to do. Don't try to define things, for how would you define yourself? As a body with a set of arms, as your thoughts, as your presence, people know you on a level far greater after an hour of talking with you than you could spend your entire life describing yourself to be. We say that to define something lets us better understand it. 
but we're only jumping to conclusions as to what each individual part is. Acting out on what we intellectually believe to be true presupposes the idea that we think that we are able to 100% understand the different facets of reality. We try to make meaning of our lives by intellectually trying to argue how this is, but a dead flower doesn't have less meaning than a growing one. Instead of trying to explain the world, live it deeper so that you may feel it deeper, for all that's real is emotion. The world wasn't created the same way electricity isn't. It is always there. The world is happening. Do you create breath when you breathe? No. Do you create love when you fall in love? Creation doesn't exist. Something cannot come from nothing. Everything new arises out of what already is. A book isn't created so much as it is the result of an author pouring out that which his mind has received from his life experience. It's a conversion of events. If to achieve a sense of unity is the main underlying drive prompting us to attach to the worldviews we do, then why not look past all that which may bar us from reaching a greater unity altogether? Well, because we also want to be right. We lose that. The necessary evil that tells us that if everyone were to agree on something, it would be impossible to know if what that is, is ultimately the right thing to believe in, as you would have no one to protest against it, to mirror it against something and contrast it with an evil that could make sense of what exactly makes it good. And so, what feels good is to fight for something, to stand against a norm, again with it not really mattering what it is one seeks to overthrow. As long as one thinks that doing it can put one closer to a personal sense of greatness, or of a unity with something higher, I believe this to be an instinctual drive. One absolutely necessary to humanity if we are to make sense of ourselves, as it is this which leads us to war with one another, through us wanting to prove and defend what we believe to be right, all for the sake of this one feeling that in turn is also the very thing which binds us together and allows for loving communities. And so, I guess it's why we don't regard this instinctual drive to belong as being more valuable than the idea we attach to that keeps a community together because to do so would be to threaten the idea itself holding everything together. We don't celebrate our rival sports team winning something, even though the feeling they earn is something we cherish on the exact same level, because to do so would mean that the rivalry itself would be threatened, and if it was to disappear altogether because of our newfound love for each other, so then, would that exhilarating feeling that winning brings, we might gain a larger sense of union with each other but we will lose the intimacy of the group due to no longer having a visible enemy to distinguish ourselves from, thereby our ability to elucidate what exactly it is that keeps us together. It is as though we have an instinctual mechanism prohibiting us from losing sight of ourselves and of being able to reflect, and so when it becomes apparent that our society is no longer winning at anything, when everything becomes so customary and self-evident that the abnormal begin to seem desirable just for being abnormal and new. When we no longer feel as though we're part of a team, and when we have no rival to compete with to reinforce the notion that we are a force to be contended with, we'll split off into our own enemies and form separate ideology, with the core reason being to find out which group can reinvigorate that lost sense of meaning again, of being part of a larger community with clear and definable parameters that gives it its own distinct identity. The right needs the left and the left the right. If being a part of any of the ideological wings is going to feel in any way purpose-driven, we can see this in the example that if one of the party's ideologies were to somehow win and completely dismantle the others, then within the structure of this new ruling party, lesser ideologies will begin to form and branch out from it. One of these new ideologies will in time become equal in size to that of the ruling one, and will one day be able to topple it once the old rule becomes too stagnant before the new one too starts to form its own set of new ideological branches. Again, this is bound to happen due to the proponents of the various ideologies all seeking to manifest their own separate sense of identity, wherein feelings such as power, victory, community, and security are to be found most clearly and made theirs. This yearning for a sense of identity within a reality as brutal and unforgiving as ours is what has over time given rise to the frightened ego structure of the despotic male, of this masculine, power-seeking, individualist society of ours. It is the vicious cycle of predator versus prey that breeds this instinct constantly seeking to make sense of itself, also that it can know what exactly it needs to protect and devour in order to survive. There's nothing wrong with wanting to cultivate a sense of identity, as it is a natural consequence of the instinctual spirit to survive that lives within all of us. But I believe that the mere act of surviving, of forming communities for the sake of being amongst one, and sharing a belief for the sake of sharing something shouldn't be what we place at the top of our hierarchical value system. 
when something that is perceived as racist is uttered. People most often don't associate it with being an aggressive attack against that race, more than they end up feeling like they need to attack the person as a means of making clear their position on the matter, so as not to be construed as being racist. A great deal of our opinions we have because they help form our own identities. They serve the individual nothing at all, but help create an image of oneself. We should instead think of surviving as a means to give way for something else. We should form communities not around what feels right for our sensations, to get high on arguing for one side, but around how those sensations can in the end empower us to the degree that we might one day be able to break free of our enslavement from them, to transcend the feelings of being right, of winning, of having something others don't. Necessary evils can only be necessary up until a certain point, until the day we no longer need them, when we feel it is safe enough for us to do so. This instinctive drive to outcompete and conquer is very useful in filtering out the aspects of society we don't find valuable or see as a threat to it. However, there can come a point when there's no longer any need to compete, as in for example within a religion wherein things have become so agreed upon they have become ritualized, which is an elevated sort of a shared understanding where new modes of being and participating in the world can grow from. Once an agreement has been made on a certain topic, the thrill of winning will cease. One might at first feel a sense of loss that the combative arena is gone, that the space between the political left and right, once ended, will cause one to lose the drive to fight for something. But we don't lose our sense of identity through coming together, it only gets bigger, through a unified belief in something. That drive is simply converted into wanting to be expressed ritually, until that ritual becomes so matter of fact that it in the end become the underlying building block that will help us conceptualize the next thing. It is only when that ritual or shared belief, after some time, starts crumbling, that we start to notice it. We don't ponder about why we wave at each other or say good morning. It is an agreed-upon ritual that enhances our everyday lives. We hug and say hi, not really knowing how these rituals all started, only that it feels right. Rituals like prayer and weekly sermons, which were equally as obvious necessities to having a good life, started losing that obvious nature to them with the rise of atheism, as it had now become something contradictory and outside of the general consensus. The ritual, once it became visible, lost much of its essence. Pronouns such as him or her were also obvious, until they no longer weren't. And until we've found a shared concept of what it means to be content and fulfilled, society on a whole will never achieve it. We seek comfort because our current social reality won't provide it to us unless we obtain it individually. The same goes for power and identity. The despotic god and the kind of world we have given rise to force us to perpetuate the cycle of endlessly seeking that which may contribute to our ascertainment of these things. Yet it is the nature of this very cycle make the things perceived as valuable. What need does one have of comfort in a world that does not already hold so much discomfort? Why feel the need for power if you've never lived in a world that has made you feel as powerless as you do? What we find valuable and is something worth obtaining depends on just how hellish your landscape is. To a thief, it's hellish enough to mug someone for it. To an oil tycoon, enough to bring extinction upon entire species of animals. Once power becomes an obsolete concept, when everyone has so much of it that nobody in the end feels as though they have any real need of it. Once everyone is so comfortable and at ease with who they are, when they don't find it's relevant to strive to make themselves an identity that separates themselves from others. When ideology ends up doing you nothing but wonder why it is you have to make yourself a belief system. When the reality of the world around you is too good to dream yourself away from, then you're in paradise. Power, comfort and identity are all but a taste of this state a state everyone is trying to get to, while in a society that has no way of providing it, and that no civilization can reach if it cannot recognize that it is only in letting go of these concepts that one in turn will receive them. A people cannot be powerful if they have no one to dominate and can in turn not be dominated by the economic system they have created unless they've made it all powerful. They will not recognize their own comfort nor find their identity differing from anyone else's, if they at first haven't cared to look for a disparity between themselves and that someone else. It is in giving up on who you think you are, that you can be anyone you want. When the concept of identity ceases to be, that you'll see more of yourself in others than in your own projection of who that is supposed to be. It is when the masculine gives itself up to the unconstrained potential of the feminine, the finite, rigid structure giving itself up to infinity. But who are you if you have no winner or loser to compare yourself to? What are you if not an outcast or a member of a community? If there is no sense of victory or loss, what is there? To not be right, 
and surrender your moral viewpoint is the hardest thing you can do as it is the same as to die for something you don't believe in. It is to let your king, the ego, die. It is to betray him. Only when an opposing idea is beautiful enough can you dispense with your current one. But in order for everyone to come together, some must dispense with theirs unwillingly. And so they must die to the Great Mother, knowing she is also the giver of life. One will be reborn. Science can't explain why music or movies work, can't use calculations. It is beyond rationality, yet it is that which most fulfill us. If you have a tradition or ideological system for too long it will become corrupted. It needs the destructive, Christian new thinking, as well as the traditional stubbornness so that they both can survive. Drama and tension is required to sustain societies. What's scary is that the alternating processes of the forces of the despotic and the devoured is what has shaped our current laws and morals. Not in a direct sense, as though we set out to create our world only to make ourselves slaves to it. No, we set out from a place of love to create something beneficial to ourselves. But it is when aspects of that project fail, when we come upon obstacles and dead ends, whether emotional, social, financial, or some combination of these, that the negative narrowing aspects begin. Society thus becomes addicted with itself, incapable of envisioning itself as something radically other than what it currently and so, to point out the flaws of a paradigm puts one at risk of being labeled a criminal. If you lived in the American West sometime in the 1800s and you were to free a cage of African slaves you felt sorry for, you would at that time be persecuted on the account that you interfered with someone's property. Had you refused to rat out a family of Jewish people in Nazi Germany, you would be punished for hiding them. In most countries, had you been openly homosexual in the early 20th century you would also have been persecuted. Our morals are based on how well they serve the majority, whether that's monetarily as in the case of the African slaves, or as in relation to one's sense of identity, which the Jews and homosexual by virtue of being oppressed elevated. The paradigms that were then would today be seen by us as utterly criminal, and the people that committed the atrocities would surely by our hand be bludgeoned. But like us, they too were possessed by greater powers they could not comprehend. Immoralities were accepted then and are just as much today depending on how much they benefit our current way of living, how much they reinforce the current interplay of the despotic and devouring god. A tribe of people would back in the day attack and wipe out an innocent village, convinced by that which would give rise to the despotic god that it was the only way to rise on the dominance hierarchy. The same thought pattern that would give rise to the devouring god would then console them with the fact that the brutal act was excused because they needed the food and shelter. And thus, the veil is created, separating our immediate sense of moral self-righteousness from the mutual nature that links all of humanity. It was the tribe's own sense of justice that drove them to do it, the same justice that would suppress and kill entire groups of people because they threatened the survival of their current regime's ideological identity. The same way many of us would hurt and even kill those that committed these genocides were we to see them before us here today, because of how their presence would threaten our honor and sense of respect for the ones who perished at their hands were we not to avenge them. The reciprocal spiral of this hunter-prey mentality is what has driven the development of civilization, all under the guise of it being our human nature. Yet, with the world's now increasing decline in both crime and war, with it being observed that rates of crime in particular are dropping by as much as 50% or more beginning in the mid-1980s and early 1990s, are we to say that this is a result of us having somehow strayed from our human nature, or that we've become better than how it's previously defined us? Animals live by conditions strikingly similar to the way in which empires and states have throughout history influenced and shaped our modern times. In the way religions and ideologies have been formed, our laws and morals, all having done so through adapting in accord with what can sustain its most immediate means for survival. The predator survives by killing and eating its prey, the religion by converting a person, the law by adequately dealing with what's right for the current time in order for the society that law inhabits to persist in the best possible manner. And so, while I can see the argument as to how our modern advancements can be evidence for how we've transcended the animalistic tendencies our ancestors displayed in their quest for dominance and territorial expansion, I would argue that we've simply refocused these instincts onto more advantageous mediums, religious crusades, military campaigns, colonization, what need of such things when companies can gain just as much wealth by just selling their users' personal information. Why the need to enslave anyone when companies can just own people through memberships and subscription services. The way phone notifications control people's attentions. The way the news control people's mood. 
If there arises a desire to dominate, then there's simply no need anymore for one tribe to take up arms against the other if it has the technology to do it covertly, remotely, without having to risk open war, and where instead of the slave being resistant, it sees its master as someone doing it a service. To some, these comparisons may sound a bit extreme, but that's the point. When you're not on the outside looking in, when one has gotten so used to how things are, and the way they make one's day go by, they become unnoticeable. Having turned into such an integral part of the framework that keeps together the way in which one perceives the outward reality. The worst judge of character is he who thinks he can accurately judge himself, as a slave owner is the worst person to judge whether what he is doing is justified or not, for he cannot see that the link between himself and his slave is a chain they're both connected to. He can only see himself as the master, as being superordinate, thus trapping himself on the summit of his supposed moral high ground, wherein everything around him is a drop, deadly in nature. And so, he remains there, frozen to his meager plot of moral sensibility, resisting to be budged by the winds of criticism trying to force him off the only place he can see everything else being below him. He and the slave are both caught in a cycle perpetuating the hunter-prey mentality that over time is bound to degrade the social structure and give way to the self-consuming interplay of the corrupt masculine gods. Whether the chain is replaced with a contract, or the hand that provides the food is replaced with money, the pattern of the master and subject remains, as with a religious crusade, that though we profess to have outgrown such vile acts, spreading one's ideology with the purpose to dominate and control has arguably become way more prominent easier and beneficial for the organizational entities of our current socio-political landscape because of how increasingly persuasive and manipulative the tactics have become. And so, while the Crusades themselves have disappeared, the purpose of them are more lucrative than ever, as the instinct that give rise to them has found its way through formats that not only conceal its true nature by way of making those that commit them and those it affects blind to what they're doing but has also found a way to more efficiently reap the rewards that such ideological possession yields. For the underlying purpose of this instinct, of this corrupt masculine spirit or despotic god if you will, is to accentuate its own identity to the degree that it becomes separate enough from the feminine to achieve absolute sovereignty, to become anti-nature, which one can easily see the patterns of in modern architecture, anti-family which we can see in our loss of values and diminishing ceremonial and ritualistic importance, anti-art, as we can see in how commodified it has become and how lacking in creative substance our films and ways of narrative expression has become. And yet we ask ourselves, why have movies gotten so bad? Why is our art and architecture so flat? Why are people so anxious? Why is there a meaning crisis? Why is the world heating up? Why are we so politically polarized? What happened to music? Well, the resulting consequence of the masculine instinct to dominate overtaking our potential for true moral lucidity has caused us to want to separate ourselves from the truth that we are all deserving of the same love as a way to avoid moral culpability, which has given rise to a collective ego structure formed out of this shared moral framework that has only served to amplify this notion and has thus suppressed the attempts made by the feminine force seeking to counteract the surplus masculine energy with the necessary artistic, visual and melodic counterforce that from a reciprocal union of contrast and harmony seeks to vitalize and inspire the importance of beauty, truth, compassion and spiritual freedom, aspects that due to them not qualifying as functional organs within the mercantilist machine, and which are seen as direct threats to its ambition of sovereign autonomy, are invalidated. And so, it becomes impossible to enrich our perspective of life through formulating a deeper sense of appreciation and understanding of art, when only half of life's multifaceted qualities have been allowed to shine forth. There's no way we can ascend the creative sphere or advance our mastery of it, when the inspiration around us that we have to draw from does nothing but reformulate the same stale and regurgitated grays of modernity. I mean, how can we look at the ordinary man, whose highest priority is to conform to doctrines that fetishizes suppressing his artistic output and that make him categorize concepts such as love, buoyancy and enthusiasm as tools that have no redeeming value unless they serve the very doctrine he currently conforms to? How is that in any way inspirational, something that we can emotionally relate to, that will bring us greater insight into what makes us who we are? In what ways does the businessman or politician remind us of our innermost selves? What profound sense of truth do they serve our imagination that will motivate us to express and reinterpret their characters beyond their mere functionality? For that is what our current narrative is pointing to for us to see, the suit, not the man behind it. 
Our emotions, our ability to express them, to understand them, thereby ourselves, aren't allowed to flourish and expand beyond the realms of sentimentality and frivolousness, as the gods we adhere to, has convinced us that they will serve us no utility in our goal toward attaining higher social status or wealth, happy states, inner peace, unconditional love and states of utter bliss. These concepts often fall on the ordinary person's ear as sap, uncomplex, infantile and anti-intellectual forms of escapism that the individual used to forget about the real world. Yet I would argue that it is merely this person's own lack of emotional insight, that because he or she is unable to fully resonate with these concepts, with that which doesn't add to one's own ambitious pursuit, infers that those who do resonate with them have a much feebler emotional threshold, immature and gullible outlook on the world. It is in some sense a psychological defense mechanism to regard the happiness that others achieve by means that doesn't require one to physically exert oneself on behalf of a corporation, or that doesn't directly play into any self-serving desires, as foolish. But it is paradoxically in this refusal to let go of oneself, of expressing oneself in ways that may run counter to the regulations of industry's social formality, of daring to leave oneself open to the raw brutality that comes with letting go of one's infantile need to cling to the tit of one's mind, to the need to be seen, to be accomplished through material effort, that the happy states, that inner peace of love and bliss, become the mature mode of being. As it is in these states where the childlike sugar cravings and need for toy hoarding run extinct, it is behind the barrier of the callous persona that people put up, that their emotional truth remain a fetus, while those have allowed it to flourish into a grown-up are able to enjoy the world outside themselves because of their broader and more adult emotional insight. One has to first mature and so a defense mechanism is comedy, revulsion, awkwardness. This same relationship is for adults and sentimentality femininity, the ability to express oneself. This happens because modern society has gotten to the point where the hunter is always out hunting and never comes back to get nourishment from his tribe. The builder is always too preoccupied with building and the father with his politics. We never get to get a clear look at what we're doing it for, and so forget why we're doing it. The one thing the empire cannot corrupt in us is what we value in narratives, what most deeply resonate with our inner selves. They can however choose what kind of stories are produced, with recent movie trends being works that have lost their human touch, their voice and their place among us, as the formats they inhabit are no longer valued on the basis of what they artistically have to offer, but on what the author financially have to gain from it. If the story fits a certain target audience, if it can flagrantly provoke people's attention, if it can elevate the creator's social status, if it can bank on an established franchise or easily be marketed through social media. What the story is about is less important than the amount of attention it can garner. Curious anticipation becomes more important than whatever sense of fulfillment we're ultimately left with. And so, pushing our stories and art in this direction will only reinforce these aspects, with the facets of the human soul that we desire to express being relegated as less important than how efficiently they can grab people's attention and capitalize on it. The nature of stories, art and music is that they are the manifestations of what we find to be of the most spiritual importance, and so to devalue their fundamental essence in favor of their economic utility is to devalue beauty itself and the importance of it. Art is the end goal of our psychic processes. It is where we find understanding and subsequently peace. Industry is a representation of the mental processes we use to get there. Efficiency, logic, grids, all are representations of categories and how categories are what will make sense of things and give us peace. But categories do not contain anything in themselves. They are not what produces what they contain. They don't say anything. The external world can only be understood by internal projections. Stories can only be good if what is happening externally on the screen invokes an internal message. Modernity invokes nothing but the fundamental instinctual survival-based nature of ourselves. The groundwork that enables us to take in creativity, not something that helps us in perpetuating it. It is in the archetypical stories of heroism and goodness that we find the true masculine and feminine residing in the stories that resonates most with us emotionally and one of the few places where beauty is allowed to show its face. It's only reasonable then that we have ended up as anxious and polarized as we are today, as true beauty, when applied properly, is that which gives meaning to life, in the sense that nothing is worth pursuing if it doesn't somehow fulfill at least some emotional aspect of oneself. Movie stars are dying because they are no longer part of cultural identity. They no longer inspire behavior and charisma. Foreign movie stars are what pull foreign audiences because they are more culturally united. 
franchises is what sells because we seek to relive nostalgia when we were more together. American heroes are always sad. In movies in America the main characters always need to change. The world we're left in is one that does not care to reflect and reinforce this part of ourselves, of our profound potentiality to become more than what we think we are. It seeks to lessen us, to quiet our ability to see it all from a greater perspective, as this would inevitably reveal its false nature and so make us turn against it. Yet, even if we do, we do not have the tools to know where to start, as our creative and visionary passion has remained at the bottom of our attention hierarchy for so long. With the tales, characters, and poetic philosophy needed to assist us in cultivating the spiritual know-how, having been suppressed as a consequence of false representatives, idols, and celebrities that have contorted the ideal we have of our species. You know when you admire someone, you don't need to see the person then examine whether you admire him or not and then deduce you do so. It's the same with life. Our struggle to find a calling as to what makes it worth living is a number one sign that something is wrong. We instinctually know what we want only the world doesn't have it blatantly on offer. This is a consequence of us not having prioritized our well-being. And that money has instead. Modern science is what can be defined by the senses, and which through their logic can be deemed as objects of truth. One needs to have senses that are functional, and so a mentally challenged isn't allowed to deem what is true in an objective sense. Our intuition is seen as something which can't value objective truth. Yet whether or not we fall in love or fall in love with a song is true. It's so true that we don't even need logical instruments to first deduce if what we're really feeling is real. You never need training in how to like music and or how to like creativity. Mythology, music and art are lesser truths because they have in the patriarchal sense no material function to stimulate. They are not that which ordain the function of the world according to scientists and materialists. Sciences, medicines such as astrology and religion don't need mechanical truths, as it is what they represent which stimulate the intuitary part of us, their technologies to develop our spiritual sides. Modern science is just another ego complex, one that has made the basis of reality masculine and material. To even dare to ponder on metasciences is to venture into fantasies, the unknown absurdities of the mind. The all-devouring feminine which destroy the pillars of rationality and which assassinate one's reputation. This is why they are ridiculed, because they make the scientist furious. They become furious out of a fear response. When the origins to a phenomenon such as all stories being the same, it's much harder to excuse there being a hard science behind this, due to the very origin of this phenomenon being located in the all-devouring mother, somewhere that's too senseless for us to explore in such a serious manner. Yet every atom, material, theory or phenomenons have come from unknown origins. The reason we are not afraid to investigate these is because we can reduce them to smaller parts that are not dependent on the bigger function. Steel can still be steel without one having to excuse the reason for its existence. Yet the feeling of tragedy cannot be named as having a reason beyond something bad has happened. We don't know the origin of our psychic phenomenology. We can't control it. And so we deem the things that can take us as far away from it as possible more important than discovering the root of it. To many, the phenomological, spiritual world is concealed and its utility unknown. I think this is a consequence of having invested so much of our time in the material. Innovation and new products are a new concept. Humanity used to use existing tools all the time. But with progress comes the death of the cycle which represents the feminine. We suffer in a modern society because the things we produce are dead and not in motion. Materials are not ends in and of themselves. They always leave us unsatisfied in pursuit of something else. To have a society bound together by ritual and song would be a society in constant motion where each moment is an end in and of itself, leaving us at peace and not looking for something all the time. The political left, having discerned the subtle forces of the corrupt masculine, has tried to assume this mantle, yet has become possessed by the rage that the forces of feminine inside has revealed. The betrayal of their purpose to aid in the reciprocal union of male and female, which has thus caused them to attempt to fight the patriarchy with the same domineering and egocentric fervor that brought about the very thing they're trying to put an end to. All out of the fact that our spiritual intelligence has been suppressed for so long that they cannot see the steps that'll let them rise above it. They perceive men, especially white men, through the filter that constitutes the fallen male, the one whose shadow is most prominent in our society. The devoured male they see as an ally, for he has tossed himself at their feet and have relinquished his own manhood as payment for their mercy. The tempered male, they do not see, 
for neither has he submitted to them nor returned any attack, for he awaits in solitude, hands aching to hold once more that of his beloveds, for he knows that only with the two together can something be born anew. He who has fought among armies for the sake of his country, who believed in the goodness of this earth, the gardener, the mechanic, the carpenter, the electrician, the plumber, the silent working class do-gooder. In him lies the spark of humility and willingness to mend. In the philosopher, the scientist, the archaeologist, yet they do not seek to disturb the greater paradigm, for they love the things in it too much to threaten their dissolution. And so, they're left with no voice to speak, for they dare not voice it. They care not to, for unlike the rulers of this day in history, who merely speak to have their voices heard, the common man do not seek power just to claim it his own, to direct and influence others, as they are matters that steal time from his sincere passions and which put him in conflict with people he will not force himself to pretend not to love. Yet, it is he who must extend his hand first, to those who have named his kind their enemy, the feminine forces clawing for justice to be dealt in the name of how greatly they've been wronged. For only he can speak with humility for the actions of his kind and to acknowledge the need for reconciliation. But how does he do it? How does he stick his hand out without them chewing it off? Who is he to fathom the evils they perceive? Why does he speak if not to shelter any motive of safeguarding his own masculine preservation? No, he can't speak to them. He'll have to find a way to speak through them and in some way, strike the heart of the deity that once sparked the vision of the future they glimpsed. 